Hello, I'm Dr. Dana Goldberg, and I'm a plastic surgeon specializing in breast surgery in Jupiter, Florida. I meet with patients every day about breast augmentation surgery, and this presentation is an in-depth overview of what we talk about during a consultation. There is really no typical breast augmentation patient. Some of my patients are teenagers who have abnormal development of one or both breasts, and some just want to get back to their pre-baby body. I even have patients in their 70s looking to enhance their appearance. Everyone has their own reasons. I have to confess that I love clothing, and I had my own breast augmentation surgery largely because I wanted to fill out my clothing better and stop buying two different size tops and bottoms. Today, I'm going to review the evolution of breast implants, including all the drama about silicone. I'll also talk a bit about what to expect before, during, and after breast augmentation surgery. Believe it or not, the first breast augmentation was attempted over a thousand years ago. Some of the materials that have been used include stone, metal, bone, and even wax. The first modern surgical reports are from the 1800s, where paraffin wax, sponge, and even tumors from other parts of the body were implanted into the breasts. As you can imagine, some of these attempts were disastrous. Formal saline and silicone implants were developed in the 1960s. In 1961, American surgeons Cronin and Giroux developed the first silicone breast implants. If you're interested, there's actually a movie with David Schwimmer that tells the whole story. Shortly after that, in 1964, a French surgeon developed saline implants so that he could make his incisions smaller. Today, modern breast implants have evolved, and now women have their choice of saline or silicone breast implants. There are even shape and texture choices, which really allow each patient to have the best implant suited to her. Breast augmentation was the most common cosmetic surgery performed in 2010, and the majority of those surgeries were with silicone implants. Over the last decade, the number of procedures has dramatically increased. In fact, there were almost 300,000 breast augmentations performed last year alone. Now I'd like to talk about what happens before and after surgery. During your initial consultation, we'll spend a lot of time talking about your desires, your lifestyle, and your medical history to make sure you have the best result and best recovery possible. There are some decisions you'll need to make about your surgery, and we'll review what you can expect after surgery. We'll also discuss risks and things you can do to minimize those risks, like avoiding aspirin and not smoking. Once you schedule surgery, you'll have a second appointment to focus on the details. Bringing pictures can help us choose the perfect implant size. Some patients bring magazine photos or Victoria's Secrets ads, and some bring pictures of themselves before weight loss or before having children. Next, I'll talk about the decisions you need to make. The first decision is what type of incision you feel most comfortable with. There's a lot more to it than just thinking about where you want the scar visually. For example, the incision in the crease below the breast is fairly well hidden and provides good access for larger size implants. The incision under the arm avoids a scar on the breast, but that incision can't be used again if a second implant surgery is ever needed. The incision around the areola is barely visible due to the natural color change between the areola and the surrounding skin, but it has a higher risk of injury to the nerves of your nipple, and this can affect nipple sensation and the ability to breastfeed. Finally, for patients who also need a breast lift, completely different incisions would be needed. You can click on the page here to learn more about a breast lift combined with breast augmentation. The next decision to make is whether the implants go above or below the chest muscle, which is called the pectoralis or pec muscle. Most women have the implants placed underneath the muscle. This helps camouflage the implant and reduces the risk of capsular contracture. A small amount of scar tissue, called a capsule, forms around every breast implant. With capsular contracture, there's just too much scar tissue, and this can make the implant feel hard and tight. For some women, the implant can be placed directly underneath the breast tissue with excellent results and slightly easier recovery. The next decision is about the implant type. Both saline and silicone implants come in a silicone shell. Saline implants are filled with saltwater solution, which is similar to IV fluid, and silicone implants are filled with a semi-solid silicone gel. 
Silicone is actually one of the most common elements found on Earth. It's found in salt, sand, and even medical supplies like injection needles. The average diabetic in America has far more silicone in their body than someone who has silicone breast implants. The silicone implants look and feel more natural, especially for women who have very little breast tissue. These implants are resistant to showing rippling, which is when the implant can be seen through the skin. Silicone implants are placed through an incision that is about 4 centimeters long, or 1.5 inches. If a silicone implant ruptures, the gel tends to stay in the scar tissue capsule, so many patients don't even know the implant is ruptured. For this reason, the FDA recommends an MRI every few years after the implant surgery to help detect what is called a silent rupture. Saline implants are more affordable and can usually be placed through a smaller incision. They also tend to project more and provide more firmness to the breast than silicone implants of the same size. If a saline implant ruptures, The saline is absorbed by the body, and the implant will deflate. If you decide to have surgery, the next appointment is your preoperative appointment, where we focus on everything you need to get ready for surgery. You'll have to visit your doctor and get lab work done to make sure you're safe for anesthesia, and we'll give you prescriptions for after surgery and a list of do's and don'ts to follow both before and after your procedure. On the day of surgery, you'll arrive about a half an hour to an hour before the actual surgery and stay to recover for another hour or so afterwards. Most patients are comfortable when they wake up because I perform nerve blocks on all of my patients during the surgery. You'll wake up in a surgical bra, which you should wear all the time, except when showering. You'll have medication for pain and nausea, as well as an antibiotic. I give every patient my personal cell phone, and I'm available by email or cell phone for questions or concerns at any time. For two weeks after surgery, you'll need to take it easy. You should avoid lifting anything over 10 pounds and avoid any activity that makes you out of breath or gets your heart racing. This will help decrease the risk of swelling and bleeding. Right after surgery, your implants will be very swollen and higher up on your chest than appears natural. This improves dramatically over the first two months after surgery and actually continues to improve for up to six months after surgery. This slide is a list of some of the most common questions that I'm asked by patients around the time of surgery. You can click on this page to visit my website and there are videos addressing each of these questions. Thank you so much for watching and please click the link to visit my site for even more information.